Welcome to the award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer finance and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky, former practice group leader for 25 years and now Senior Counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar, and I'll be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget about our blog, consumerfinancemonitor.com. We posted our blog since 2011, so there's a lot of relevant industry content there. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. So to subscribe to our blog or to get on the list for our webinars, please visit us at ballardspar.com. And if you like our podcast, please let us know about it. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you obtain your podcasts. Also, Please let us know if you have ideas for other topics that we should consider covering or speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. I'm very pleased to tell our listeners today that our podcast show on November 30 of this year was ranked by Good to Be Social, a very prominent consultant that focuses on social media and law firms. It was ranked as the number one podcast among law firm podcast show in the United States devoted exclusively to consumer financial services. And we were ranked number 11 overall among all types of podcast shows presented by law firms. And we are extremely gratified by this recognition from one of the country's leading social media consultants for law firms. So today, uh, our show is part two of a two-part podcast series of a repurposed webinar that we did on Tuesday, November 28th, entitled The Biden administration's junk fees initiative continues. What the latest actions mean for the consumer finance and housing rental industries. And for those of you who missed part one of this two part series regarding junk fees, you should definitely download uh, part one because it very much complements what you heard today. As part two. Let me introduce uh, my colleagues. First of all, Roger Winston. And uh, Roger uh, is the leader of our firm's mixed use condominium and multifamily development team. Uh, he's in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and of course, he's, he's part of the real estate department. Uh, and he has been very, very heavily involved. Uh, uh, in counseling our housing rental clients, uh, clients that uh, rent out apartment buildings uh, and other types of rental housing, uh, because that is very much a target of the Federal Trade Commission. So I uh, also want to introduce uh, Kristen Larson. Uh, Kristen uh, is in our consumer financial services group. She uh, came to us from having practiced for many years in house uh, at um, a, a couple of banking institutions, uh, where uh, one of her focuses was on uh, various fees charged by deposit charged by banks to deposit account holders, particularly checking account holders. So uh, we're going to be talking, and Kristen will be discussing what's going on in the world of uh, overdraft fees and fees that are related to overdraft fees. 
uh, John Colhane's no uh, stranger to any of you. He's probably been on uh, more webinars than, uh, than any of us, probably other than myself. Uh, John is a very experienced consumer financial services lawyer, uh, has practiced for decades with me. Uh, and whenever I introduce John, I, I hesitate to say what he specializes in or focuses on because it's really everything in the consumer finance world. Uh, and junk fees is just part of his, uh, uh, I guess you could say, uh, expertise that he has. Uh, and then Michael Gordon. Uh, Michael uh, is one of the more recent people that has joined us, although Michael's been with us for more, well over a year. Uh, and he uh, came to us after having spent quite a bit of time at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, where he uh, reported directly to Richard Cordray, had a very senior position there, uh, and has brought to our clients uh, the expertise and the experience he's had with the CFPB, and most importantly, how the CFPB thinks about things like jump fees. And last but not least is Reed Herlihy. Uh, Reed is in our mortgage banking group, and uh, Reed uh, also uh, is focused very much on various kinds of uh, fees uh, that are charged by mortgage originators and servicers. Uh, a lot of fees that um, uh, the regulators don't happen to like. And now I would like to turn the program over to my colleague, Mike Gordon. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to very briefly touch on an issuance from the CFPB that relates to fees. It's a slightly different kind of animal than some of the other things we've seen, but I wanted to just briefly mention it. The good news is if you're not a large bank or credit union supervised by the CFPB, then legally, technically, this one doesn't cover you. Um, the bad news is <laughs> it, it represents part of a theme here about fees that the Bureau is very uh, focused on and will be scrutinizing for all players in the consumer finance industry. Um, and, and so I think there are themes here that, that are, are relevant for everybody. Um, what, what, this, what makes this one different is that there is a specific statutory hook here in the Dodd-Frank Act that the Bureau is interpreting in this advisory opinion. And that statutory hook uh, is up on the screen and talks about consumers requesting um, information about their accounts and the requirement that that uh, large uh, depositories respond to those requests. What's, what's a little unusual uh, is that there is no regulation for this and the Bureau didn't propose one. Instead, they did an advisory opinion here, which as we know, could be reversed at the drop of a hat if, if the leadership of the Bureau changes. And it's unlike the other advisory opinions they've issued, which really build on uh, perceived ambiguities or points of emphasis in existing regulations. Here, we just have statutory language, which the Bureau is interpreting, as you might imagine, in a very broad, consumer-friendly way. Um, and this overlaps the junk fees theme with another big theme that we're seeing out of the Bureau recently, which is a focus on customer service. Um, and here, uh, again, unlike other sort of initiatives or uh, pronouncements in the customer service area, this one has a statutory hook to some extent, and then the Bureau is interpreting that very generously. The, statu uh, the statutory language is right here, um, and the, the advisory opinion by the Bureau interprets it to prohibit charging a fee for uh, consumers who request this information. In other words, you get the request, you have to honor it, and you can't charge a fee for it. And furthermore, the Bureau goes to lengths to say that you can't unreasonably impede the, the customer's availability, ability to exercise this right. Um, they provide a little more gloss on what that means to them, but um, it, uh, you know, it basically boils down to having to provide the, the, the information uh, promptly um, and it includes examples of what sound like kind of customer service issues that could amount to a, a, an impediment that the Bureau uh, would object to. Um, so, for example, 
making them wait, excessively long wait times to make the request, uh, making uh, it necessary to make the request more than once, uh, having to deal with a chat bot that does not, um, you know, quickly and efficiently answer the question asked and provide the information, um, or, you know, pawning the request off and directing the consumer to a third party. These are examples that the Bureau has outlined of things that might be, you know, in impediments that uh, would be unreasonable. Uh, so I'll pause briefly on the chatbot notion just because um, we've seen the Bureau raise this chatbot in, in idea and, and sort of AI generally in multiple different contexts. And this is an example where they're honing in on it uh, as a potential source bot for them um, here based on this particular statutory authority, but in other cases really based on kind of a UDAP notion um, and they're they're concerned about reliance on chatbots and and that being uh, representing sort of poor customer service um, that that they're trying to uh, uh, disincentivize. Some questions raised by this uh, advisory opinion are you know what is a request? The bureau didn't really define what the customer has to do to avail itself of this right. And it kind of leaves institutions, I think, having to interpret that rather relatively broadly. And certainly, you'd want to take a look at your policies and procedures to make sure that it's, they address the issue of, of what so that employees can recognize when these requests come in and, and respond appropriately. Um, and um, I think there's also this sort of hanging the question of what are, where does the line get drawn on customer service? So in this example you know, what's an unreasonable impediment in the Bureau's eyes? How long a wait time is too long? What kind of information problems in a chat bot uh, will cross the line for the Bureau um, if other avenues are available for the consumer to get information? So um, that's a brief overview of, of this. And I would just say, as I mentioned at the top, it's directed at large depository institutions, but all providers who are charging a fee for um, you know, accounts and account information uh, should probably be cognizant of this and the atmospherics of it and the bureau skepticism of that kind of fee. Thanks, Mike. Next, we're going to cover CFB supervisory and enforcement actions. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the CFPB spotlight on NSF fees. Um, as you know, since late 21, the CFPB has been closely monitoring everyone's practices for overdraft and NSF fees. They've even resorted to what we like to call public shaming, where they post everyone's NSF and fee practices, trying to influence financial institutions and in reducing the amount of NSF and overdraft fees um, that they charge. And even though we've seen the trends of fees being eliminated, fees going down, um, as discussed earlier, this is something that still is on their rulemaking agenda, um, even though it doesn't really seem like there's a need in light of the fact that a lot of institutions have removed the fees. Um, and then in their most recent supervisory highlights, um, again, their original one was on junk fees was issued in March of 23, which we covered at our last webinar. And then this fall issue kind of expands some of those findings. Um, specifically with respect to deposit fees, um, examiners found UDAPs related to multiple NSF fees for the same transactions. And, and for this, they were going after both core processors and supervised institutions, like, because the issue is a lot of you are dependent on core processors. And if the core is not making a change, it's very tough for you to make a change on how you assess the fee when that's outside of your control. Um, the continued attacks on authorized positive settled negative fees. Um, that's in those fees they say are unanticipated and also a, a UDAP because the customer can't avoid them. Um, now, again, we believe that these fees can be avoided by maintaining a sufficient balance and tracking your purchases and withdrawals. Um, and then paper statement fees and return mail fees for paper statements that weren't actually delivered. Like sometimes you put someone in your system is it's a bad address, um, but then yet you're still charging them for those state statements that you didn't mail to the bad address. 
Um, and also they had concerns about return deposit fees, which they've also previously addressed. Um, and they also in their guidance, and I just cite these here for background, they cited some of their prior guidance that they did on authorized positive negative subtle negative ORF fees and their circular, their bulletin on unfair return deposit did item fees and their advisory opinions on not liking it when debt collectors charge a fee to make a payment. And then finally, I wanted, before I turn it over to John, I wanted to cover the guidance on reopening closed deposit accounts and some recent litigation. Now, I know we covered it briefly at the prior webinar, but I just wanted to remind people that this is still on their radar um, and it looks like it's also transitioned over to the plaintiff's, plaintiff's bar as well. Again, they think it's an unfair practice if you reopen an account that was previously co closed to accept either debits or deposits. Um, the National Bank that recently finalized a settlement for $4.9 million class action, um, the allegation was that they reopened their accounts without their consumer's authorizations and transactions posted. And essentially what the CFPB is concerned about here is that there's the consumers could be harmed by the reopening of accounts, that they're, the fees that could be charged after an account is reopened or transactions or fraud that could happen when the consumer doesn't realize their account is reopened. And now I'll turn it over to John Colhane to talk a little bit about the auto servicing supervisory app. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm going to briefly run through uh, auto servicing, um, remittance transfers, and uh, payment processing, and then one um, uh, item in the supervisory highlights identified as a remedial action um, that, that also is uh, auto-related, but it's not entirely clear how it involves junk fees. So most of the auto servicing um, observations in the supervisory highlights uh, focus on the servicing related to add-on products and uh, in particular uh, the failure to provide appropriate refunds when uh, financing is terminated early. And the CFPB uh, focused on two uh, bad actions here. Uh, one, uh, not actually uh, acting to make sure that you, the servicer, uh, get the money uh, in the first place, which seems to be more of a vendor management uh, issue than a, a junk fee issue, but uh, it's in here as junk fees. And then making a mistake in calculating the appropriate amount of the product refund uh, when the loan or credit is terminated early. early. Um, and again, here relying on service providers, which would seem to be a vendor management issue, uh, also has been, is again swept in under the, the junk fee category. So this isn't really the assessment of a fee on a service. It's um, arguably charging more for a product or service or charging for a product or service that isn't actually being delivered. But as I mentioned at the outset, that's um, clearly now within the ambit of the junk fee category. The remittance fee part is, is a little clearer in that the violations in supervisory exams um, were, were fairly clear cut involving the failure to disclose fees that would be assessed before funds were wired. So obviously reducing the amount of the funds going to the sender and then also uh, failing to comply with the provision of Reg E that uh, sort of uh, slaps the hand of the uh, remittance transfer provider if it promises to deliver funds within a particular time frame, and is unable to do so, regardless of the reason. Um, if the funds aren't received by the promised date, then uh, related fees have to be refunded. Um, we've included here a consent order. It's not actually part of the supervisory highlights, um, but it seems to be in the same vein. And this is a, a consent order against Chime that was doing business as Soundwave. And it's somewhat similar to some of the uh, comments about the uh, supervisory examinations and the, the air violations found there in that uh, it really focuses on uh, misrepresenting the speed and cost of remittance transfers. 
Um, but also part of the consent order are uh, actions that the that the company was taking that um, the CFPB didn't like, uh, requiring customers to waive their rights. Here, there, there's not really a fee being assessed, but um, what was what the company was doing was uh, limiting its liability for losses and also limiting damages to one thousand dollars. And the CFPB asserted that those were violations of Regulation E. Um, failing to provide disclosures, failing to provide timely disclosures, failing to investigate errors. Uh, these are more mainstream violations of Regulation E. Um, interestingly, although this seems very similar to uh, some of the actions that are mentioned in the supervisory highlights uh, regarding remittance transfers, um, there's no mention of junk fees in the press release uh, or uh, in the consent order. Um, but this clearly seems to be within the ambit of conduct the CFPB will object to. Um, in terms of payment processing, uh, I think what we now are seeing, if we hadn't realized this before, is just how far the CFPB is willing to push its jurisdiction over payment processors, uh, because here it's gone after uh, online payment platforms that are involved with school meal programs uh, and uh, assess fees for uh, adding money to student meal accounts. Uh, there's a requirement under federal law for any uh, company that assesses fees in this circumstance to also make free options available. And the CFPB uh, has noted in this supervisory highlights that it uh, learned about uh, payment processors, payment platforms that were involved in these functions and uh, and that weren't complying with the disclosure or providing either the disclosures or, or with providing uh, free options, uh, in which case it felt that consumers would have paid fees that they would not have paid if they'd known of the existence of free options, which apparently made those fees, even though disclosed, uh, junk fees. Um, then there's a, a kind of a throwaway comment that's not directly related to junk fee issues, uh, but the CFPB points out that the fees that were assessed disproportionately affected lower income families uh, that must use smaller amounts more often. It's not clear what the message is here regarding very, regarding um, fees, assessing fees in these circumstances, whether they're uh, supposed to be adjusted based on the population or whether this is just another uh, concern that the CFPB had about the practice. And then lastly, in the CFPB supervisory highlights on junk fees, the CFPB notes in its uh, section on remedial actions, uh, a lawsuit it brought against an automobile loan servicer uh, about a host of uh, illegal practices um, that it asserted harmed individuals. And really, these are about disabling vehicles and then uh, in, improper wrongful repossessions, double billing. A again, none of these are specifically identified either in the press release or in the uh, complaint uh, in the lawsuit as uh, being junk fees, but it seems pretty clear that the, the CFPB would consider um, double billing to involve junk fees because it's, it's payment for a service uh, that isn't provided, uh, misallocating payments, Maybe a junk, maybe in junk fees because it may uh, trigger additional interest or, or late fees, and then uh, failure to return uh, unearned uh, gap insurance premiums. Uh, we know from the auto uh, servicing section uh, with uh, examination matters that that, that involves junk fees. Um, it, it's unclear how disabling vehicles or uh, activating late payment warning tones uh, would be. Would, would clearly be tied to junk fees, although perhaps the, the warning tone uh, might be encouraging a payment that's not due or, or suggesting that a late fee is going to be assessed when that's not the case. Um, but we have the CFPB pushing the envelope here on uh, what exactly is covered by its junk fee rhetoric, uh, both fees, uh, its fees in and of themselves, and then uh, conduct or, or the failure to deliver, to deliver, to properly deliver goods and services. 
Um, let me turn it over to Reed to talk about uh, some of the enforcement actions in this area. Yeah, Reed. thanks, John. Uh, and so I'm going to cover some of the more recent enforcement activity from the Bureau involving these sort of junk fee issues and along the lines of what John just described. These are, you know, I, I use that term pretty liberally. These really cover a, a wide range of costs that you wouldn't necessarily consider a, a typical fee or, um, you know, it really can seems to constitute anything other than principal on the loan or you know, interest paid on that principal. Um, and, but here we see a lot of interesting angles for you know, alleged improper conduct. Um, so first, uh, from August of this year, uh, the Bureau filed suit alleging UDAP violations by a brick and mortar high cost installment lender. Um, and they alleged company-wide practices from underwriting sales and servicing activity that were really designed to channel financially vulnerable and struggling borrowers into a cycle of fee heavy refinances. Um, and this included underwriting practices that were allegedly designed to enable the origination of loans to borrowers who were likely to struggle with payments uh, and that would you know, have to refinance multiple times so they could collect those, those fees. Uh, according to the complaint, sort of by way of background, the company's installment loans had a, a median and annual interest rate of 92%. Uh, the median loan principal amount was $585. Uh, the, the complaint stated that nearly 10% of the company's borrowers uh, refinanced their loans with the company 12 times or more, um, but the, the refinance activities for that, roughly 10% of the company's borrowers, uh, produced 40% of its net revenue. Uh, the next example is more you know, along the lines of what we typically think of as a fee issue, but uh, we, we saw in July this year multiple consent orders against the National Bank that included um, one of the consent orders pertaining to their NSF fee practices, and we all know they've signaled you know, for a long time that NSC, NSF fees were, were, were a focus. Uh, the complaint alleged uh, you know, UDAP violations um, for the practice of charging multiple NSF fees on the same transaction, either you know, whether they're checks or ACH payments. And they were charged first when the payment was initially submitted and declined, uh, and then again on the resubmitted payment or the, you know, the representing transaction. Uh, the Bureau stated that the practice was unfair and, and exposed some pretty, or imposed a pretty extensive remediation uh, against the bank. And the third example here was from May. Uh, the Bureau entered into a consent order with a, a personal loan installment lender alleging UDAP violations related to uh, certain add-on insurance and identity theft products. Uh, this, the, the central conduct at issue involved misleading into misleading consumers into thinking they were required or, or couldn't get out of purchasing add-on products at the time of origination, or sort of coercing them to do so. Um, and, and to further assuage the borrowers, the company told them they could you know, simply cancel the add-on products within a certain time frame after origination at no cost at all. And the Bureau you know, indicated through the, through the complaint that that meant you know, they were conveying to the borrowers they would be returned to the financial position that they would have been in had the product never been added to the loan. Um, however, for the loans eligible for a full refund, while the lender refunded the premiums paid, um, the full interest on those amounts um, were not refunded. That would be needed to return the borrowers to the same financial position. Uh, and that failure to refund the amount of interest either involved miscalculations of the interest amount or you know, no attempt to refund the interest at all, depending on the product. Um, according to the order, this was both deceptive and unfair and also uh, abusive. And the abusive theory was that it interfered with the consumer's ability to understand uh, the add-on products were optional and, and that the, the lender you know, charged non-refundable non interest during the purported uh, full refund period. And so those are, the, those are the examples of enforcement. And I'm going to quickly move on to um, some, some state activity. And we're also at the point where you can click on the on the slide here to confirm you're still uh, attending. The state junk fees laws. Uh, I wanna start with a law in California. Uh, so Governor Newsom uh, signed into law a statutory amendment addressing junk fees, uh, focused on what they call the practice of, of uh, drip pricing. So advertising a price that's less than the, the actual price that they're gonna pay. Um, it, it's similar to what you know, the FTC has proposed or, or one aspect of the FTC's proposal, but um, Thankfully, here in California, they did give some, some you know, thoughtful time to addressing and enacting some pretty broad exemption provisions uh, that should exclude a large range of uh, regulated consumer financial transactions. Um, so this, this goes into effect on July 1, 2024. Uh, similar to that 
you know, component of the FTC proposed rule, the law prohibits advertising, displaying, or advertising a price for a good or service that doesn't include all mandatory fees or charges other than taxes or delivery charges. Um, notably, there there is an existing private private right of action um, for the law where this was in, you know, included in addition to regulatory enforcement. And, and again, the good part here is thankfully we have a, a wide range of exemptions for regulated financial service providers. Um, so first, the exemption provision defines the term financial entity by referencing a different provision from the California Consumer Fi Financial Protection Law. Um, so a financial entity would include depository institutions, as well as a range of state licensed entities, uh, escrow agents, finance lender licensees, regulated uh, residential mortgage lender licensees, uh, broker dealers, et cetera. Um, and then providing you know, a company meets the criteria to be a quote financial entity under that definition, um, that entity is exempt from the junk fee law requirement for a particular transaction if it's required to provide disclosures in compliance with a range of federal or California laws in connection with that same transaction. And so those disclosure requirements include the Truth and Savings Act, EFTA and Reg E, uh, Section 19 of the Federal Reserve Act, TILA and Reg Z, RESPA and Reg X, uh, HOPA, the, the California Finance Lenders Law, uh, the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, or the California Real Estate Law. Um, so, you know, these exemptions should you know, thankfully cover most of you out there, but obviously you want to pay very close attention and review them for the range of transactions you may provide because, it, again, it's, it's transaction specific and not just an entity-wide exemption for, for certain types of companies. Um, I should also note, I didn't really touch on it in the slide, but there are some additional nuance here as they apply to vehicle dealers, lessors, and vehicle manufacturers. Uh, there are some distinct disclosure requirements for vehicle lessors that are added in a different provision. Um, that you have to follow to avoid violation under the, the general prohibition here. Um, for vehicle dealers, you can continue to admit um, in the advertised price certain fees and costs that you're otherwise you know, permitted to omit by existing law, like vehicle registration fees or, or document processing charges. Uh, there's also a provision that specifies that a vehicle manufacturer or another party can advertise the MSRP without violating, again, this, this general prohibition that I previously outlined on the, on the previous slide. Um, with, without running afoul of that. So that's California. One other example of state legislation, uh, this hasn't passed yet, but um, Pennsylvania, has, the House passed House Bill 636, which they've dubbed the Pay the Price You See Act. Um, this bill's only passed the House, and we know Republicans hold a majority in the Senate, so you know, the prospects of it being enacted may, may not be that strong. As for the terms of the law, it's, it's similar to to California in that aspect of the FTC proposal, prohibiting advertising, displaying, or offering a price of goods that doesn't include all mandatory fees or charges um, other than taxes. So they only carve out governmental taxes here, not things like delivery charges as we see in California. And the bill doesn't appear to include yet at least the types of broad exemptions found in the California law. Uh, but again, it has only passed the House. And with that, I'll move on to talk about some additional observations and, and future rulemaking. Thanks, Reed. So we're getting close to the end here, and I wanted to just step back and provide a few higher level observations and maybe look around the corner a little bit to what, what to expect in the, in the near future. So as you can tell from the myriad of ways in which the Bureau is talking about fees and coming after fees, you know, there is no end to the Bureau's creativity and interest in this topic. Um, we see it every day in our practice and exam requests, um, in other types of market monitoring requests and other information requests. We see it in enforcement activity, um, and we'll see it in, in future rulemakings. Um, and, and I would say, in addition to the, the credit card late fee rule that there's press out today indicating perhaps before the end of year, in addition to the credit card late fee rule of an overdraft late fee proposal. Um, so uh, one, one topic that we haven't, I don't know that anyone's really focused on, but I just wanted to flag because we see it sometimes in, in the exam context, is the relationship between the service or function that the provider is giving and the cost, what the, what the Bureau refers to as the marginal cost to that institution of providing that service. 
the Bureau, as we know, doesn't have, uh, in general, any uh, authority to set fees or set rates for financial products. But they'd like they they like to get close to that by uh, by this notion of criticizing whether the fee itself is out of whack with the costs incurred. And we see this happening. And if you haven't gotten requests like that, it's something you might want to think about and prepare for. Um, and uh, it, it's troubling and th there may not be authority for the Bureau to specifically dictate any uh, fee in the, in the abstract, uh, absent some statutory provision as in the Card Act for the credit card lay fee rule. But uh, it doesn't stop them from trying and from looking closer, more closely at those fees that they, they think don't, aren't justifiable. Um, I mentioned earlier the focus on customer service. So when thinking about fees, it's not just the fee itself, but it can be the surrounding uh, activity uh, about in, informing customers at a point in time that a fee is coming, giving them an opportunity to avoid it if it's avoidable and, um, and the like. As to the credit card late fee rule itself, we we expect that to come any day, frankly. Um, and the proposal has been out for a while. For those who aren't uh, covered by that, um, then you, this this may be new. But uh, it, essentially, it it sets a um, under the under the applicable statute, the bureau has is proposing to reset a safe harbor amount for a credit card late fee at $8, which is a, a large reduction. Um, it would still permit credit card companies to charge late fees that are above $8, but then you would have to prove that the fees are in line with, with the collection costs. Um, litigation is very likely once the, fee, the, the rule becomes final because uh, commenters ha have focused on a number of procedural problems that they see with how the rule uh, was written. Uh, it, m one notable example of that has to do with the impact of the rule on small businesses, both small providers and small uh, entities that are uh, affected as consumers. And there's a process for gathering input on those kinds of impacts on small entities. And the Bureau kind of bypassed that in this process. And even the, the Small Business Administration commented critically on, on that oversight in the process. There are other procedural problems and concerns about the data underlying uh, the Bureau's analysis here that we can expect to see, I think, in challenges uh, to the rule once it becomes final. Uh, and I won't get into more detail about that. Um, that's been the subject of other uh, discussions and webinars we've had, but uh, there has been a notable uptick in, you know, in litigation in recent years against the Bureau for its rulemaking and courts, certainly in certain jurisdictions, be, being more open to hearing uh, arguments that the Bureau has overreached or has procedural problems in how it's um, issuing in, uh, its rules. Uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to briefly address, you know, what, what, what you can do if um, – to mitigate your risk in this area. Uh, I would just say, you know, we often get asked to help clients conduct a compliance review of their fee structure and their fee practices. And there's no substitute for that because a lot of this is fact specific about how you interact with your consumers um, at various points in time. Um, and from our experience with exams and enforcement activity, we have a good sense of the kinds of questions and issues that the Bureau is likely to focus on. Uh, we also have developed, developed somewhat of a framework for analyzing fees in light of the regulatory risks, asking questions like those on the screen about the underlying authority for the fee, um, whether uh, there's implied or expressed authority under federal or state law or the agreement in itself, here, the business rationale for charging the fee, and I would add the it's it's useful to review the correlation, as I mentioned, between fee and the costs of the service provided. Uh, disclosure issues, of course, um, are always part of any kind of review, and um, and then you know just keeping tabs on what the bureau has found to be abusive or said they're 
uh, is a high prior priority for them in the fee universe. Um, you know, examine your customer service models with a fresh set of eyes. Um, emphasize transparency when you can with respect to fees, not just the amount of fee, but the purpose for the fee and the timing of when it's going to be imposed. Um, these are all kind of helpful hints that go into, uh, you know, a sound review for compliance risk of, of a fee structure. So with that, um, we have finished our formal presentation. I'll turn it back to Alan to close. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mike. And I want to thank my other colleagues, Reed Hurley, uh, John Colhane, Kristen Larson, and Roger Winston. Uh, let me just mention a couple, two things in closing that uh, I'm not sure we really got into during the program. And that is um, the relationship to state law. <clears throat> the FTC has said that it only, th this rule, if and when it becomes final, will only preempt state law to the extent that it state law is inconsistent with the final FTC rule. Um, and inconsistency basically means that it's impossible to comply both with the FTC rule and state law. Uh, that is a very narrow uh, test uh, for determining if there is any preemption. The likelihood is that there won't be preemption uh, and that other state laws that get passed or that exist already, uh, you may have to comply with them. Uh, and they may be old state laws, not necessarily Pennsylvania or California that Mike talked about, uh, but uh, there could be laws on the books uh, from long ago uh, that deal with the same subject matter that uh, the federal regulators are now very focused upon. And one other final thing, and it occurred to me uh, to mention this when I saw the uh, slide uh, that Reed presented dealing with the new California law, there is an exemption in there for transactions that are covered under other federal statutes. The FCC has indicated that it is willing, they would, they would like comments on that subject, on whether there should be a, some kind of transactional exemption uh, which if uh, they were to agree to that, uh, then um, uh, you may not have to worry about, depending upon your situation, uh, you may not be covered by the final FTC rule. But I certainly wouldn't count on it right now. Uh, there, there's no indication uh, that the CFPB has a feeling one way or another on that issue but they have opened it up for comment. To make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or whatever platform you regularly use. And don't forget to check out our blog, which goes by the same name as our podcast show, consumerfinancemonitor.com, uh, on our blog, we have daily insights regarding the consumer finance industry. And if you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email us at podcast, that's singular, at ballardspar.com. And stay tuned each Thursday for a new episode of our show. My thanks to all of our listeners and I wish all of you a good day. Thank you again.